So this is the uh, Daniel Revelation class for beginners. It's a subtitle for beginners, lesson number two. And um, as I said last week, we're, uh, we're studying the book of Daniel as a way of understanding the background information and the imagery and the symbolism that is contained in the book of Revelation. I told you last week, a lot of times people go to the book of Revelation, they don't even bother studying uh, Daniel, they pull out you know, images and language and symbols and they attach to them all kinds of meanings according to modern, uh, the, the modern political situation, uh, thinking that uh, these refer to uh, modern times uh, without ever having looked at the book of Daniel, and the book of Daniel is almost like the foundational book to understand correctly the symbols in the, uh, in the book of Revelation. So we talked about that last week, just in case this is your first time in this uh, particular class. As I said, much of the language and the apocalyptic style of writing found in Daniel is also found in the book of Revelation. And if we understand the meaning of the symbols, uh, when, how, and why this type of language, this type, this, uh, let's call it a literary style, uh, when this literary style is used in scripture, uh, it'll go a long way to help us understand uh, the meaning and the lessons contained in the book of Revelation. Also, a lot of the prophecy in the book of Daniel is fulfilled in the book of Revelation as well. So, uh, you know, it's very hard to study the fulfillment of the prophecy, but ignore the, you know, the original prophecy that was made. So that's why, again, I'm making the argument for studying these two books uh, at the same time. Also, unlike some other type of uh, uh, studies that we've had, the book of John, for example, the Gospel of John, in that particular class, we're studying line by line, every single line, we read it, we, you know, we, we take it apart, so on and so forth. Uh, Daniel Revelation, if we were to do that, we could never finish it in the short time that we have. So it's, a, it's a, a bit of an overview of one book and an overview of the other to grasp the main ideas, the main thrust of each book, especially understanding the symbolism. So um, let's talk about Daniel, let's talk about Babylon. Um, um, Daniel, uh, let's talk about him first. Uh, Daniel was a uh, young man from a well-to-do family in Jerusalem who was carried off into captivity by the newest world power emerging at that time, uh, Babylon, and its greatest king, King Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, let's talk about Babylon, the city and the empire. Very interesting, fascinating study. Babylon was the greatest city and empire in the pre-Christian era. Uh, now Assyria ruled before uh, Babylon and it ruled the longer, but it was never as great or as beautiful as Babylon. Babylon had architectural wonders and so on and so forth. The Assyrians were fierce warriors. They went in and killed you, took your money, you know, <laughs> killed all your people. You know. The Babylonians uh, had a much higher uh, culture uh, than the uh, Assyrians. Um, it was ruled for most of its domination, its world domination by Nebuchadnezzar, 45 years in all that he ruled. Uh, and he um, never tired of beautifying and improving uh, this great city. Uh, ancient historians say that its walls uh, around the city were 60 miles long, 15 miles on each side. Uh, the walls were 300 feet high, 30 stories. Think about that, 300 feet high, 80 feet thick, 35 feet into the ground so enemies could not tunnel underneath. Everything was made from brick. Um, there was a quarter mile of cleared space around the wall where a moat was built. Um, 250 towers, 100 gates of brass, sentries posted everywhere. It was, you know, it was a fortress. 
It was a fortress, nobody could get in. Powerful fortress. Now the city itself was divided by the Euphrates River that flowed through it uh, and there were drawbridges to get across. There were 53 temples in the city, 180 altars to the goddess Ishtar. And the goddess Ishtar was the goddess of war and love. So it was a kind of a male dominated society. <laughs> Their goddess was a, a female, but she was the goddess of war and the goddess of love. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar's palace was huge. The walls, 50 feet thick. This is a remnant. This is not just a, this is actually a, a picture, a remnant, there's still remnants of it left. Nebuchadnezzar also built one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, and that was the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. Some scholars, some archeologists say, no, you know, these were actually built in Nineveh. You know, there's a little debate going on about that, but uh, anyways, I, I don't want to go into that minutia. Most individuals, most historians believe that the Hanging Gardens were in Babylon. He built it uh, for his queen. The gardens were platforms, 400 square feet, and they were held up by arches that cascaded down one from another. They were filled with flowers and trees and shrubs. And um, uh, you see a bit of uh, that in the rendition here. And all of it was watered from a reservoir at the very top that was filled, uh, was fed rather, by hydraulic pumps from the uh, Euphrates River from below. You know, we sometimes think these ancient cultures, you know, they had no engineering, but they had uh, amazing engineering. You know. uh, many years ago, uh, when I went to Jerusalem, I, they still had, they, the guide brought us to the aqueducts that the Romans had built, they were still there, to bring water all the way to, you know, to the desert, a aqueducts, built 2,000 years ago, still standing. Still functional, they could, fun they could still function if they needed that. Uh, obviously they have modern ways of transporting water now, but if they had to, they could still, they could still work. Uh, that's amazing when you look at some of our bridges and things that were built 50, 60 years ago that are crumbling and falling apart. You know? So uh, it was amazing, amazing engineering for the time. Um, underneath the arches were luxury apartments, the pleasure grounds of the palace. Uh, and these were built while Daniel was the chief governor of the wise men in Babylon. Um, Isaiah chapter 13 verse 17 and Jeremiah in chapter 51, both of these prophets prophesied that this great city would not only be destroyed, but it would remain uninhabited forever. Well, in 539 BC, Cyrus, who had taken over Media and Persia and Elam, those nations. He led his army into Babylon and he captured this seemingly indestructible city and nation without a single, you know, they wouldn't have a shot, but you know, without a single blow. And the way that he did it is they secretly diverted the flow of the river and marched the army on the empty riverbed underneath the wall at night and captured the city by surprise without losing a single, a single soldier. Now, uh, the city of Babylon remained an important city throughout the reign of the Medo-Persian kings and even to the reign of Alexander the Great. But after his death, the shift of power went to Rome and the city uh, declined. And by the time of Christ, it was mostly in ruins and except for archeological expeditions, uh, it, was, uh, it remained abandoned even to this day. Again, this is not a photograph, uh, this is not a, you know, a, a painting, this is an actual photograph of the ruins uh, of uh, Babylon that uh, tourists and pilgrims can visit to this day. Anyways, it was this city, you know, I, I want you to imagine you know, this great city 
projecting all this tremendous power, military power, a, a world dominating um, um, nation, it was in this city and this empire that Daniel and several of his friends were brought for retraining and re-education by uh, Nebuchadnezzar. And so the book of Daniel represents Daniel uh, in chapter seven and uh, uh, chapter seven, verse one and 28 as its author. So Daniel, we know that Daniel writes about this place and we know he's the author because he names himself. So we have some internal evidence about that. Uh, it was confirmed as Daniel's work by Jesus himself in Matthew 24, verse 15. So not only does Daniel name himself, Jesus names Daniel as the author of Daniel. So we don't have a lot of arguments there. It was also accepted by the Jews and early Christians. In other words, this book okay, was considered authentic by the Jews and by early Christians. And this view was unanimously held until the rise of what we call modern criticism that contended that it was actually written in the second century before Christ by some unknown author. A lot of modern criticism does that. You know, say, well, we don't know who wrote it, it's not Daniel. And they begin with the idea that miracles can't happen, so then they, you know, they, they go from there with that. Uh, but this theory has been rejected by most scholars, both Jewish and Christian scholars, still believe and contend that the book of Daniel was written by Daniel at that particular time. Uh, it was written in two languages, uh, Chaldee or Aramaic, which was the diplomatic language of that era, just like at one time the diplomatic language in the world was French. Uh, if you were a diplomat, you spoke French. Uh, today the diplomatic language is, is English, but at that time Chaldee and Aramaic was the diplomatic language, so chapter two uh, all the way to chapter seven is uh, in that language, and also in Hebrew. Uh, the rest of the book is written in Hebrew. Of course, this is what might be expected from a book written for Jews living in Babylon, containing information describing their actual experience in Babylon and references to their own Jewish past and future. So part of it is Aramaic because it talks about you know, the, the, the present culture, uh, what's going on with Daniel as he lives in this city, and then especially the parts that deal with prophecy and so on and so forth that would have a lot more to do with Jews, that part's written in Hebrew. It, many ways to outline the book, if you wish, but it pretty much you know, breaks itself down. Part one is the court of Nebuchadnezzar. So Daniel describes his surroundings and what, what is happening to him when he's brought into the court of Nebuchadnezzar. Part two, Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Chapter two, verse one, all the way to 49, where Daniel you know, describes what took place with the king's dream and what happened. Then chapter three to chapter six, we have four episodes in Daniel's life. Okay, four things that happened to him that he describes. And then part four, four visions of Daniel's prophecy, chapter seven, verses one to 28. All right, well, let's talk about Daniel the person, shall we? Daniel, uh, we believe, was of a noble family, probably royal blood. Josephus, who was a, a Jewish historian at the time of Christ, who wrote about Jewish history, he says that uh, Daniel was probably related to King Zedekiah of Judah, who was the king at the time of the Babylonian, um, you know, when the Babylonians took over, which is why Daniel and his friends had access to the Babylonian court. Otherwise, they would have been placed with the common people. So they took the, you know, they took the best uh, workers and uh, you know, tradesmen and so on and so forth, and they took the cream of the crop of the young men who were, uh, who were educated and who were part of the royal court, and the, the fact that Daniel ended up in, in, the, in the Babylonian court to be trained in the king's court uh, suggests that he was also part of the royal court when they were in uh, Israel. 
Um, he rose to a position of great power because of his ability to interpret dreams, his visions and his great piety and faith in the Lord. Uh, he was a young man when he went into captivity and he died an old man still in Babylon 72 years later. He lasted through the reign of five kings, beginning with Nebuchadnezzar and lasting to the king or to the reign of Darius the Persian and all the way to Cyrus the Mede in 534 BC. And even though the Jews returned from captivity after 70 years, Daniel stayed in Babylon until his death. We know that he was God's witness in the palace that ruled the world during his, during his lifetime. All right, let's talk about, um, that's just a little bit about Daniel, a little background about him, and I think we're pretty familiar with that. Let's talk about the court of Nebuchadnezzar. And I'll ask you to open your Bibles to, uh, to Daniel chapter one. In the third year of the reign of Je uh, Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the vessels of the house of God, and he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasury of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, the chief of his officials, to bring in some of the sons of Israel, including some of the royal family and of the nobles, youths in whom was no defect, who were good looking, showing intelligence in every branch of wisdom, endowed with understanding and discerning knowledge, and who had ability for serving in the king's court, and he ordered him to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. The king appointed for them a daily ration from the king's choice food, and from the wine which he drank and appointed that they should be educated three years, at the end of which they were to enter the king's personal service. Now among them from the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Then the commander of the officials assigned new names to them, and to Daniel he assigned the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah Shadrach, and to Mishael Meshach, and to Azariah Abednego. But Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's choice food or with the wine which he drank, so he sought permission from the commander of the officials that he might not defile himself. Now God granted Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the commander of the officials. And the commander of the officials said to Daniel, I am afraid of my lord the king who has appointed your food and your drink, for why should he see your faces looking more haggard than the youths who are uh, your own age? Then you would make me forfeit my head to the king. But Daniel said to the overseer whom the commander of the officials had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days and let us be given some vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let, us, uh, let our appearance be observed in your presence and the appearance of the youths who are eating the king's choice food and deal with your servants according to what you see. So he listened to them in this matter and tested them for 10 days. At the end of 10 days, their appearance seemed better and they were fatter than all the youths who had been eating the king's choice food. So the overseer continued to withhold their choice food and the wine they were to drink and kept giving them vegetables. As for these four youths, God gave them knowledge and intelligence in every branch of literature and wisdom. Daniel even understood all kinds of visions and dreams. Then at the end of the days, which the king had specified for presenting them, the commander of the officials presented them before Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and out of them all not one was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's personal service. As for every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king consulted them, he found them 10 times better than all the magicians and conjurers who were in all his realm. And Daniel continued until the first year of Cyrus, the king. Now, I want you to notice that in a compact first chapter, Daniel summarizes the reason why he and the three others are in the palace of the king. Now, part of the training was to immerse them into Babylonian culture, and this included eating their food, unlike the Assyrians. Like I say, the Assyrians, they just went in, they killed you, you know what I'm saying? They just killed you and they robbed you and they took what they wanted. Anybody they left, 
Anybody left, they just took them and they just threw them in different nations to water down their bloodline. That's how they work. Babylonians had a different foreign policy, if you wish. Uh, they would bring the cream of the crop, bring them into the service of the Babylonian court, retrain them, uh, immerse them in Babylonian culture and literature, art, you know, magic, and so on and so forth for several years. And then, among the best, they would select them to go back to their own countries to rule in their stead. That way, uh, they were trying to, uh, they were trying to uh, infiltrate their culture into other peoples. That was their way of dominating uh, other nations. So as I say, part of the training was to immerse them into the culture, especially the food. So the young Jews accepted and excelled at the academic training, but they refused to eat the food. Of course, a lot of reasons for that. Probably that it was food sacrificed to idols, uh, food not prepared in the proper way, you know, what we call kosher today. Uh, probably some of the food may have been uh, considered unclean for a Jew. Of course, this test of faith results in the Lord's blessing them so that they maintain their right to eat without violating their conscience and they succeeded in impressing the king and securing a very high position in the palace. And usually I like to give the lessons at the end. You know, what have we learned? But I mean, this little episode here just begs to bring out a couple of, uh, a couple of obvious lessons. For example, we need to decide in advance how we will react to temptation. We need to decide in advance if something's going to happen, if we're tempted in a certain way, if somehow a situation arises that will you know, tempt us to compromise what we believe, what is right. We need to decide in advance what we're going to, what we're going to do. Um, it says that Daniel, you know, they had decided in advance, if we go somewhere else, we're not going to violate our conscience by eating food that, that is unclean. So when the moment came, they weren't flustered. They knew exactly how they were going to uh, respond. I tell the story about my daughter, uh, uh, Julia, our eldest daughter, and when she was in the Marine Corps. And uh, she was a nice, uh, you know, uh, blonde-haired, blue-eyed Marine, and there were a lot of young Marine men who wanted to date her. She was a single girl, good Christian girl. And uh, she once told me, well, I, I said, how do you deal with that, uh, Julia? And she said, well, I give them the pep talk. I said, the pep talk? What's the pep talk? She said, well, if somebody asks me out for a date, I say, well, I, I'll go out with you, you know, to the movies or dinner or whatever, but uh, there are a couple of rules. And the guys would say, okay, what are the rules? She said, well, first of all, under no conditions are we going to have sex. There's nothing you can say, nothing you can do, nothing you could buy me that will lead me to have sex with you. So you know, that's off the table. Don't even think about that. It's never going to happen unless we're married. Number two, we're not going to take drugs, not even for fun, not even just once. It's never going to happen. And number three, you won't get violent with me because I have a big brother and he's in the Marines too. <laughs> and so I asked her, well, Julia, did you get a lot of dates? And she said, no. <laughs> but she says, the ones that I got, however, they were good dates. And that's the way she found the right guy who said to her, no problem, that's great, let's go. And he is her husband now. And they've produced two beautiful children and one more on on the way. Anyway, it's a good story. You know, she was telling uh, this young man, here are my standards. Before we even leave the house to go to the movies, here, here where the standards are. She had decided in advance exactly how she would conduct herself under uh, various uh, circumstances. Another lesson here. I, I'm looking at Bob there and he's just dying to say something, but he's, hold, he's holding himself in and that's good exercise for you, Bobby. God tests us not only with trials, but also with opportunities. We always think, you know, if we're having a lot of trouble, you know, my sore back, this happens, I lose my job, whatever. You know, well, this is a trial and you know, God is testing me and, 
And yeah, sure, that's where our faith is, you know, in, in, the, in the crucible of suffering, our faith is strengthened. But sometimes He tests us with opportunities. Because sometimes opportunities to get ahead in my job, in my career, also will mean that I will take a step back in my faith and in my service to God. I tell people, you know what? We're always praying for God to open a door of opportunity, but you know what? Satan can also open a door of opportunity for you. We have to be careful when we're looking at an opportunity to make sure that that opportunity will not you know, be some short-term gain, but will result in long-term loss if we have to compromise our values. You know, maybe I, if I cheat in just this little thing, boy, I'll be able to get way ahead. You know? You're never really way ahead. And so they had an opportunity here. Hey, we're, we're young guys and we're in a foreign country and we're actually slaves. We have a shot at, at, at living in the court and serving the, you know, the king and so on and so forth. You know, I mean, surely God won't mind if we eat the, if we eat the unclean food. Surely God, you know, haven't we suffered enough? And yet they had decided in advance that they weren't going to compromise. And so that, what looked like an opportunity was really a snare. And by holding fast to what they knew was right, God, God blessed them anyways, despite the obstacle in front of them. Another lesson, God always rewards obedience. Sooner or later, God rewards obedience. With Daniel, He did it sooner. With Job, He did it later. But sooner or later, God will reward us for our obedience. And maybe one other thing here before we get too bogged down. You never know. You never know why God has put you where you are. You never know why the test is what it is. Daniel's impact lasted centuries, but he didn't know it then. So you never know if the doing of right in your humdrum routine might have tremendous impact later on. Or the reverse, avoiding uh, to confess Christ or avoiding to do the right thing might eliminate you from contributing mightily to the kingdom. You, ne you never know. In any case, we see that Daniel's position is secured with God and with the king by the way that he conducts himself in the early stages of his captivity. And so we move on to chapter two to Nebuchadnezzar's dream. This chapter describes the beginning of Daniel's ministry of prophecy in the king's court. And what takes place is the following. The king has an unusual dream that makes him anxious since he doesn't understand what the dream is. Now the Babylonians were adept in the black arts, the occult and magic. They would try to foretell the future by reading the stars or they would cut open an animal and take out its vital organs and they would try to read the future by reading you know, the organs of the dead animal. Uh, they also put a lot of importance in dreams and what, their, what the dreams meant. And so the king calls his wise men, a collection of sorcerers, astrologers, counselors, ministers, to give him the interpretation of the dream. Now there, there was a catch, however, and the catch was he doesn't tell them what the dream is. He tells them they have to tell him what the dream is and then interpret it. Well, obviously, that's pretty tough. He also tells them that if no one can do this, they're all going to be executed and their homes will be destroyed. And that included Daniel and his three friends who were part of this group of advisors. So I'm kind of summarizing the story because we're not going to read the entire chapter here. So the wise men confess that they can't do what the king wants them to do and so the king decrees that the, all the wise men in the land are to be executed. And so when Daniel hears this, he and the three 
other Jewish youths go to God in prayer and God reveals the dream and its interpretation. And then Daniel goes to the king with his revelation and saves himself and the others. Now the reason he could go into the king was he was considered one of the wise men along with the others. So I just want to read one portion of chapter two beginning in verse 31. Daniel says, you, O king, were looking, and behold, there was a single great statue. That statue, which was large and of extraordinary splendor, was standing in front of you, and its appearance was awesome. So Daniel is telling the king what he dreamt. The head of that statue was made of fine gold, its breast and its arms of silver, uh, and its belly and its thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You continued looking until a stone was cut out without hands, and it struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and crushed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed all at the same time and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them was found. But the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and covered the, entire, uh, the whole earth. This was the dream. Now we will tell its interpretation before the king. You, O king, are the king of kings to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, the strength, and the glory. And wherever the sons of men dwell, or the beasts of the field, or the birds of the sky, he has given them into your hand and has caused you to rule over them all. You are the head of gold. After you there will arise another kingdom inferior to you, then a, another third kingdom of bronze which will rule over all the earth. Then there will be a fourth kingdom as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron crushes and shatters all things. So, like iron that breaks in pieces, it will crush and break all these in pieces. In that you saw the feet and toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it will be divided, it will be a divided kingdom, but it will have in it the toughness of iron inasmuch as you saw the iron mixed with common clay. As the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of pottery, so some of the kingdom will be strong and part of it will be brittle. And in that you saw the iron mixed with common clay, they will combine with one another in the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, even as iron does not combine with pottery. In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed, and that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. Inasmuch as you saw that a stone was cut out of the mountain without hands and that it crushed the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will take place in the future. So the dream is true and its interpretation is trustworthy. So in the interpretation of this dream, Daniel not only describes the king's mind, but he also prophesizes concerning world events into the next 650 years. The dream, right? A great statue shining, the head of gold, the breast of silver as well as the arms, the belly and the hips made of brass, the legs of iron, the feet a mixture of iron and clay. A stone, he says, appears out of nowhere, cut without hands, and it strikes the feet of the statue, and the statue crumbles to dust and is blown away. The stone grows into a mountain which then fills the earth. And so, what is the interpretation, Daniel says? Well, the head is gold and is the embodiment of the kingdom of Babylon, the first great and magnificent world kingdom. As I said, the Assyrians also ruled before them, but not with the splendor and wealth and total control that the Babylonians had. The breast and the arms of silver represent uh, very well the dual nature of the Medo-Persian empire that conquered and replaced the Babylonians. Another interesting thing as well is that silver coinage uh, and this people's wealth in silver fits well the imagery of the of the dream because the Medo-Persian Empire was rich uh, in silver. Also the idea of the two arms, two different nations ruling 
simultaneously. Then he talks about the belly uh, and the hips of brass, refers to Alexander the Great and his armies, which will be the next world power after the Medo-Persian Empire. Now Alexander, is interesting to note, innovated warfare by introducing brass armor in combat. Then of course the Roman Empire is described as legs of iron with feet of mixed clay and iron, and it was the next great empire that defeated the Greeks and took over as a world power. Now, the Romans introduced iron weapons into warfare. At the beginning, they were tough, they were unbreakable, like iron is unbreakable. But as the empire grew, however, it began making alliances with other nations rather than conquering and ruling them by force. So their modus operandi at the beginning is they come in and they, you know, like the Assyrians, they kill you and they take over, or they subdue you, enslave you, and you, know, you pay taxes, and if you step out of line, we go in and you know, we wipe you out. They were ruthless and powerful, and they were truly a world empire. But as the empire grew and grew and grew and grew, you know, it was so big, it began to be so bulky to be managed, instead of fighting wars way at the other end of the empire, what they would do is they would make treaties with nations on the edge of the empire. Wouldn't conquer them, it would just be a threat. We know all about threats, right? Countries making threats. And so uh, it would be a threat. You know, if, if, you don't, if you don't pay so much taxes, you know, we'll leave you alone, but if you don't pay so much taxes, we're going to go in and going to wipe you out. So they began making these alliances. And that's what the, uh, the imagery here. If the legs are steel, but you get down to the feet and the toes, those, he says, were a mixture of iron and clay, and inasmuch as iron and clay don't mix, well, the same thing happened to the Roman Empire. The nations at the periphery eventually came in and ransacked uh, Rome. And of course, this is represented by the feet mixed with iron and clay. And then the stone cut without hands, of course, uh, a stone that just appears, the idea, the imagery, refers to something supernatural, something that is not of this world. The small stone totally destroys the statue. Uh, and notice where it hits, it doesn't hit in the head or in the chest, it hits at the feet, right? It hits at the feet. So the small stone totally destroys the statue, conquers the essence and the substance of the statue. All the power, all the control, all the dominance, all the glory completely shattered. And so, in the dream and in the interpretation, Daniel says the stone is a kingdom established by God never to be destroyed and always alive and growing. And eventually, he says, will dominate everything and everyone and last forever. Kind of sounds like the church, doesn't it? Kind of sounds like the church. So once Nebuchadnezzar hears this, if we continue reading, we find out he falls on his face to honor Daniel as a true prophet and worships the God of Daniel. He also makes Daniel the head of all of his wise men and counselors in the palace and his three friends, the administrators of the province of Babylon. You know, this is a tremendous prophecy because of its clarity and its exactness. I mean, he said that this dream was about the future rulers of the world. I mean, he called it. Also, he gives the exact number that there will be and the order and enough information from the dream to identify who will they be. I mean, we can't even predict who the next president's going to be in three years from now. And here, Daniel <laughs> is telling him which nations are going to rule in the next 650 years. That's a tremendous prophecy. He prophesies correctly about the coming of the church and what exact period of time that it would appear and destroy the opposition. He even correctly interprets the idea that some of these kingdoms would, uh, would never revive. They were all blown into dust. None of these kingdoms, Babylon, there's no Babylon anymore, there's no Medo-Persia anymore, none of these kings, Rome, yeah, there's Italy and Rome, but no, would anybody think that Italy is a world power today? I don't think so. So this section is important, not only to prove the inspiration of the Bible, but also to set the scene for what will take place in the book of Revelation. That's why I read 
we're not going to read every line of every book here, but it was important to look at this because this is the basis upon which many of the symbols and prophecies in the book of Revelation uh, are taken. Okay? Um, it's not just a, an, a, a, an instant bit and, and, and a destruction. You know? uh, what he talks about is a, is a struggle for several centuries that will finally end in a victory uh, for, the, for the church. Tremendous prophecy. The thing that really strikes me is he talks about the coming of the church and he places it in exactly the right historical context during, during the, um, the Roman Empire and the, and the fact that it will destroy the empire. Christianity overtook the empire of Rome. All right, well I think the first bell went so we're going to stop there. Next week we're going to talk about what Nebuchadnezzar does with this interpretation and we're going to begin looking at Daniel's, uh, Daniel's vision. So that's it for this week. Thank you very much for your attention.